welcome everybody. I hope, uh, hope everybody had the opportunity to uh, enjoy the summer of jazz I mean, you know, I think we're the area I'm in, Dr. Miller, towards 96.6, and my uh, daughter and granddaughter went down around Cedarville, and it was 100%. It just it was it was pretty amazing. I mean, it had such a short duration. But, you know, what it, what is it? Another forty four years before that occurred, and now it's time around. But again, I hope everybody had the opportunity. So uh, we, the commissioners, uh, offered the opportunity for residents, tax taxpayers, and others to. Uh, Make public comment. If you wish to do so, please approach the podium and give your name and address for limited to three minutes. So, who would like to be first? Good morning. I'm Melissa Hoover Connor and I live at 7710 Cattail Road in Ple or outside of Pleasantville. As a concerned lifelong citizen of Walnut Township, I would like to address a loss that goes unmentioned when a playground bully comes to town. You know how we are concerned about well water quality, field tile, battery, fires, property values, and the like. But by this bully preying on our farmland, our community has already been damaged. Neighbors stop speaking to each other. Folks stop patronizing local businesses that may have a different view. Nasty posts are made on social media. Rumors fly. I got involved with Citizens for Fair Fields because, well, I'm a farmer's daughter. And I knew I could not live with myself if I didn't try to protect our farmland and our community. Educating the public as to how this process works is essential and very challenging. And I'm learning as I go. I like to say, but this is my first rodeo. <laughs> According to Senate Bill 52, an exclusionary zone may be put in place for wind and solar. If the projects we know of, Eastern Cottontail, Ripley, and Carnation, are partially grandfathered or grandfathered, the zone will not apply to those projects. Those projects will not be stopped by the Board of Commissioners. Project approval or denial will be decided by the Ohio Power Siting Board. So... You don't need to worry about a lawsuit because you don't have the final decision on partially grandfathered or grandfathered projects. However, including these lease lands in the zone demonstrates to the Ohio Power Siding Board the unity and conviction Fairfield County has about how to use our prime farmland, a finite resource that feeds people. When frankly, there are still too many questions about how this will all play out. Putting the lease land in exclusionary zones reinforces the outcome of the many meetings held to determine our county's future in the updated land use plan. The bullies have a lot of experience under their collective belts. It's nothing for them to spin and out and out lie to avoid answering questions. They prey upon us, good folks that we are knowing that we don't fully understand the process and they start years before we have any idea that we're going to have to learn all about it, spend tens of thousands of dollars of our own money to get representation, and then cross our fingers that the unelected Ohio Power Signing Board will decide in our favor. Commissioners, we want to work with you. We want a transparency coming from your office that reassures that you are doing all you can to protect us from those who don't play fair. For instance, EDF Renewables has purposely started misspelling Eastern Cottontail on government documents to avoid detection from the citizens of Fairfield County. Why would anyone want to be in business with this playground bully. Gentlemen, please support us.
Hi, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak again for my family and my community. My name is Selena McCord. I live at 8640 Rockner Road, Millersport, Ohio. And I want to talk about fighting for the generation behind this, about pre preserving this beautiful country in which we have God-given rights, I focus on teaching my six kids integrity because I want them to grow up and be thankful for a good life. My husband and I want them to crave good over evil, putting others over their own selfish motives and fears. We would like to just be able to have our local government to model that integrity as well. I love our country. My dad served in the United States Air Force for half of my childhood, and he instilled a love in me to do what's right for our country. So just a little bit about us. Our family downsides from a big suburb home in um, a lofty neighborhood with an HOA and all of that just to have this peaceful, happy life with my kids, um, to be able to have community. We've had a lot of interactions with our neighbors. Um, we raise our own chickens. We've been able to share our, our eggs. Um, we buy beef from our farmers across the road. Actually, they helped us tow our truck out yesterday from the mud with their big tractor. And we just love the, we love what, where our kids are seen in this small town community. If solar industrial farm, if a solar industrial farm became our neighbor, this would no longer be a peaceful environment and everything would change. The flooding is a concern in our township. I know a lot of you saw that last week as we drove home. The whole project area was just flooded. And we've spent thousands of dollars um, in our 1910 home. And we have one sump pump <laughs> in our cellar. And it can only handle so much. The runoff created from the solar panels would not create a natural flow of water. There was a lawsuit at a home called Honeybee Ranch in California. Because the local solar, solar company did not do the proper planning for the flooding in the area. It was awarded $6.5 million in damages. Did EDF renewables do proper testing for flooding grading or stormwater management activities that are necessary? It's important for us to consider. This would affect my family. We do homeschooling. My husband's business is based at home. And just to mention a little bit about EDF renewables, they're a nationwide company of 35 years. I'm sure you know that. And they do use bullying tactics to push their projects along. They threaten lawsuits if people choose to change their decisions. And they um, they do this with before it's even physically done. It doesn't even include if their testing could be faulty. We've even had an incident three weeks ago where we had to call the local police because we had a car, uh, it's actually a truck with an Indiana license, pull over to the side beside the field beside our home. It was, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, you know, this does, um, if you would look at EDF's site, you will, their website, you will see that they have a comment that says it creates minimal impact of a community. I disagree. It's already affected us. In Kenesho Township near Kaysen in Minnesota, EDF pushed a project of 1,200 acre, uh, 1, acres in without the township, um, township board or the local trustees even having a say. And you can look that up if you want. But just like Millersport, this land is important to our local identity. I live in Millersport, and the Sweet Corn Festival is a big identity marker for our community. So I just request, thank you. I request that our board would seek review, and I also ask that you would choose to not grow weary in doing right and have courage to fight for the generation behind us. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Sean Redinger. I live at 840 Baker Road in South Hill, Ohio. I'm a lifelong resident of the Manda Clear Creek School District. And I'm here today to uh, comment on exclusion zones. Um, I understand that these are being proposed for the county. Um, we look at the founding of this great nation. We can go back to as far as the Magna Carta and realize that this was something special. The United States of America was founded on the principles that man could govern with himself. Exclusion zones give the power of two people in this county to dictate what 160,000 will do with their land. To me, that's tyranny. 
My father was in the United States National Guard during Vietnam. You know, my father, my grandfather fought in Iwo Jima in World War II, preserved the concept that men should be able, and women should be able to govern themselves freely. Um, as a farmer and a small business owner and a solar leaseholder currently, I'm here to say that exclusion zones will only ruin the opportunity for the next generation of my family farm. And I know there's people scratching their heads right now at that comment, but it's fact. We're living in an area where Intel has encroached on our county. That's why we're talking about all this planning. But my children, the fifth generation of our family farm, will probably not have the opportunity to farm because buying ground and continuing our farming operation has become prohibitive. From when I bought my farm, which we've lived on for, I've lived on for 50 years, my parents sharecropped that with family until 2018. My wife and I were fortunate enough to be able to buy that farm. Um, and so hopefully that we can keep up what we're doing. But as we go forward, the, what we paid for that farm in 2018, land prices have quadrupled. I don't know anybody that can pay today's current land prices and farm them unless they've been given thousands of acres through generational wealth. I'm a first generation farm owner. I just bought, me and my wife just bought this property. Um, we also run a full-time business to subsidize it because the thousand acres we farm will not make a payment on that farm that we purchased. We knew that going in. I'm not asking for sympathy. We have a plan. And now we're making a business decision with this solar lease because it is going to allow us to hopefully expand our operation elsewhere so our fifth generation has an opportunity. Without this solar lease, we would be stuck at 1,000 acres. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how we can buy ground and continue doing what we do as a family. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that this works out. And I'm also very faithful in the U.S. farmer because, you know, as we take the latest stat run around Facebook's 20,000 acres, or have came out of production parks. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we grew a record crop last year. The American farmer always figures out a way to produce good, effective, cheap food for the American consumer. And then we continue to do that. So I ask that you guys, as we go forward, do not consider to go down the road of tyranny and try to dictate what the 160,000 citizens of this county do on their ground. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to be next, please? Gary Pimer, 3464 South Bank Road, Walnut Township. I've got my map holders here. From my own map, not knowing if you guys are going to have a map today or not. This is from the USDA, and it's the cropland for Fairfield County. Okay. Also, the dark green area and the yellow area, and it's got the different types of crops and everything. It was 2022. We have people online. If you're able to speak into the mic, that would oh, be helpful. Sure. And I know online you can't see this map, but all of the dark green area and the yellow area on that map, and this is according to the USDA, which the farmers have to report what they're growing. Okay. Uh, the latest one that I have is 2022. Uh, so that's a year and a half ago. Um, and you see over where Eastern Cottontail is going to be. That's my farmland. It was all grown in soybeans and corn and, and then down here in Amanda. There's the other project. The solar companies want prime farmland because it's easy for them to do construction. That's going to be destroyed. Uh, last week's meeting... Cypress Creek Renewables, the representative was here. They're taking over up in Liberty Township, which we thought that project was going to be dead, but it's not. They're starting to lease more and more land right now. Um, EDF is continuing to lease land. Um, right now, it's almost 2,300 acres. And 
I appreciate the, the gentleman that talked about farm and everything else, but when you take that land out of production and you say we're saving it for the future generations or, or whatever, 30 years, it's going to be out of production for 30 years. That next generation is going to have some other, um, some other job, some other career. It used to be where farmers was generation after generation after generation. If you read the letters that have been sent in to the commissioners, there are letters in there from landowners, and one of which is, has leased a, a lot of land, talking about how their kids grew up there and they learned how to work on the farm and the beauty of the farm, and they leased it to solar. 30 years, those kids aren't going to farm that land in 30 years. 30 seconds. So we need your support, and we need for you to continue the entire 13 townships as exclusionary zones. And I know some people talk about property rights, but what about, so property rights of approximately 12 landowners cannot infringe upon hundreds of owners with their property rights. So I hope you do the right thing. Who would like to be that, please? Anyone else? Last chance. Kevin Elder, 6800 Baltimore Somerset Road, Pleasantville, Ohio. And Thank you for the opportunity to speak again. Um, on these projects, we have seventh generation farms, Elton Road, Pleasantville. Um, we have still not had any contact with EDF after attending their information meetings or anything else about our concerns for drainage and stormwater runoff, both coming our farms drain onto the proposed project, and we take two 500-acre watersheds off of the project. They're primarily solar. Concerns about these projects would have been solved if they were covered under local zoning. Uh, the reason that there's the opportunity for exclusionary zones is the fact that it's not covered with local zoning. I had one of the uh, representatives discussing with me last week. He said, well, you could have warehouses on this property said, no, you can't because it's not zoned for warehouses. The use of this, these properties after the 30 years or 40 years that it's in utility concerns me. But there's been no research that shows it can go back to being good farmland. With the infrastructure installed uh, and previous experience with utilities, it's doubtful whether the inspections there and the requirements to put it back to where it was before could ever be attempted. So I, since there is no zoning, I encourage the use of exclusionary and hope you support those. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to be next, please? <clears throat> Thomas, 4718, Baltimore, Somerset Road, Pleasantville. It seems like the land use plan is the only topic that has been discussed for several months now, maybe even a year. Meanwhile, EDF and the Eastern Cottontail Solar Project moves forward to its goal. We have been asking for an exclusionary zone for over a year now. This has really affected my quality of life for almost two years. I am personally outraged finding out that after spending two years of my life dealing with this project that will destroy farmland, devastate our community and people's lives, that the Eastern Cottontail Solar Project is potentially being excluded from the exclusion zone back. Because someone might get sued. People get sued every day. 
In my world, the facts, truth, and goodness still prevail. If Eastern Cottontail is partially grandfathered, which we would like to see the proof on that, according to Senate Bill 52, in my understanding, an exclusionary zone would not apply to this project anyway. Excluding Eastern Cottontail would send a message to the Ohio Power Siding Board that our commissioners have given in to EDF. I would certainly hope as a taxpayer and a citizen of Walnut Township, my elected officials would think our community is worth fighting for, and they would want to preserve the land and protect the taxpayers. If so, you will include Eastern Cottontail in the exclusionary zone map and use some of our tax dollars to fight for our community before our time runs out. We have been waiting for this conversation for over a year now. Isn't this part of the reason I pay taxes? For protection from things just like this. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hi, I'm Beverly Sturm, 1556 Rath Mill Road, Lockbourne, Ohio. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And I also want to thank you for all the meetings that you guys had at the townships last fall. I thought that was awesome. Thank you for um, meeting to create the exclusionary zone in the first place. You may ask why, why is somebody from Lockbourne, Little Lockbourne, Ohio here to speak? I am a property owner in Fairfield County. I grew up in Fairfield County. I appreciate the support you've given the Fairfield County. Um, I know you support the 4-H at the county fair. I am here because between my mom's side and my dad's side, um, I'm related to probably half the people in Fairfield County. <laughs> you know that, <laughs> My aunt Rita Ricketts was mayor of Pickerington. She was like the first woman mayor. Um, so I have really deep roots in Fairfield County. Again, I appreciate that you are working to create an exclusionary zone. Um, I want to remind you of all the taxes that are generated by farming in Fairfield County, whether it be property taxes or income taxes. I was amazed at how much income tax my family had to pay recently. Um, sales tax as well. So I'm asking you, I'm beseeching you for the love of God and country to please include all of the townships in Fairfield County in the exclusionary zone. Thank you very much. Like to be next, please. Nice chance. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you for your comments and thank you for coming. Amy, anything else, Amy? Okay. Jeff, you're up, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, for this week in review, we have um, a couple of items to discuss. One of them is the Corsa renewal. Uh, this is the three-year renewal with the county risk sharing authority. Uh, the county uh, has a joint self-insurance pool that it participates in with other counties. And this uh, overall reduces our risk and prevents losses and injuries. However, um, we have experienced an almost 20% increase in this year's rate for Corsa. This is largely due to the reinsurance market and the inability to obtain reinsurance uh, that covers law enforcement matters. Uh, this is happening across the country. So this is the second year that's occurred, uh, but wanted to make you aware of it. Um, the, uh, there is a resolution for the approval of the three-year agreement in today's voting portion of the meeting. Um, April 30th, Board of Commissioners meeting will uh, be in the evening at 7 o'clock at the Wagner, Wagnalls Memorial Library in Lithopolis. Uh, the commissioners hold four evening meetings per year, and uh, the meeting uh, allows those who are unable to attend at a 9 o'clock hour to attend a commissioner's meeting during the year. The first uh, meeting was evening meeting was in January. We have another scheduled August 6th at the Wigwam Event Center in Pickerington and one in November, one on November 19th that will be held in Pleasant Township. Um, and now move on to the highlights of resolutions. 
administrative approvals. There are a list of the administrative approvals that took place this week in your packet. Uh, today, there are 14 or excuse me, 15 resolutions on the agenda for the voting pattern today. Um, you will note that uh, there are uh, four resolutions to appoint members of the Violet Township New Community Authority. We had done this previously, and these are all the same individuals that we uh, appointed previously that are being appointed at this time. Uh, Felicia Hentz, Doug Houck, uh, Doug Williams, and Lori Saunders. So those are on for today. Um, we also have a resolution authorizing uh, the use of additional ARP funds for the Fairfield County Sewer District's regional lift station project. Uh, Director Vogel, would you like to speak to that? Sure. It's a uh, regional lift station for Violet Township. Um, this is the funds got changed. Stacy, for doing transfers at Fairfield Recovery Act dollars. Um, it is going to take all of the western portion of Violet Township to. We'll have all the Violet Township covered as far as sewer and water. That's great. And uh, as we continue to wind down uh, the spending on the American Rescue Plan funds, we may see some shifting between now and December um, on those funds and what, what we're expending them upon. There's also a resolution authorizing the purchase of a modular uh, from the City of Lancaster Board of Parks Commissioners for a dollar to use as a training facility for the Sheriff's Office. Um, we will, the county will be responsible for all the costs associated with permits, repairs, removal, and transportation from the modular's current location uh, at 701 Un Union Street. Uh, there's a resolution to approve loan documents for the Fairfield County CARES Act Revolving Loan Fund for Beer Geeks, uh, LLC, Double Edge Brewing Company. Uh, Rick, would you like to speak to that one? So this is just the official paperwork to uh, provide the loan to uh, Double Edge, a great downtown Lancaster uh, kind of cornerstone, and they are running on a canning operation to be able to sell canned beer out of their uh, location. Smart growth opportunity. Thank you. We also have a resolution to approve an MOU, uh, an MOU for the commitment of funds to the Ohio University from Super Rapids funds previously awarded to Fairfield County. As previously announced, the state of Ohio allocated the funds to Fairfield County through House Bill 33 in the 135th General Assembly for Ohio University for Engineering Technology and Healthcare Programs. Um, We've agreed to um, reimburse OU up to $1.48 million for purchases for these programs. Rick, would you like to speak to that one as well? Yeah, so my friend Mr. Coach is here, has been helping work on the uh, engineering technology lab build out. Um, then with that will be about $1.2 million of new equipment uh, for engineering technology that OU will put into there. And uh, the rest of the funding is for respiratory therapy lab, which uh, will be going uh, in May, down to St. Clair College to look at their respiratory therapy lab. I'm going to get a lot of research on that. So, uh, some really nice new programming that we'll be able to offer. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Representative Bray for helping get this through the House. And uh, we're starting to see that money trickle in. And uh, it's definitely good. Great. Thank you, Rick. Uh, we also have a resolution approving the bid award to U.S. Bridge for 93000 for the WAL05 Guider Road Superstructure Replacement Project. I don't see anybody from the engineer's office here today. Um, and finally, we have a resolution approving the bid award to uh, Cooper Concrete Services for the CDBG Village of Pleasantville uh, Pool Improvements. Uh, Holly, did you want to speak to that? Uh, this is uh, for the neighborhood revitalization grant that's presented before uh, that the county received. Um, we were timing this project with the um, summer because the pool shares access with and property with the school district. Um, so we're getting the forwarding now so that my school gets done. We can start the construction. Thank you very much. Um, we have a uh, budget review. Uh, but before you do that, Charmaine, so the <laughs> resolution about Corsa, you <laughs> through that, and I'm sure I just didn't understand what was being said, but there's a line in there about uh, car insurance for $630,000. And 
couldn't understand why we would spend six hundred thirty thousand dollars on car insurance. We're not spending six hundred thirty thousand dollars for car car insurance. Um, that we do. What what the program total cost is for the year is about six hundred and eight thousand for all of our liability coverage, including auto, errors and omissions, um, all of the buildings that we have. One thing that we do have to keep in mind about our coverage with Corsa is things are changing and being adjusted now because the reinsurance markets are, are becoming much tighter um, in that process. Our current um, deductible for auto is $5,000. Right. So I just I saw the number. It seemed like it was part of that card, but I got it. Thank you for yeah. clarifying. No, no problem. Um, we'll move on to the budget review, and we have Stacy Nisley here uh, in place of Bart Hampson. Um, I sent out the budget review email invites Monday. Um, most of you have already responded. Um, thanks to John and Garrett with EMA for um, setting me up with the bookings app, Office 365. I've heard that that's been very successful and helpful. So just thank, thanks to you both on that one. If you have any questions, just let me know. We're going to move on to calendar review and invitations received. Thank you. The CPS Child Abuse Prevention Month Breakfast is tomorrow at 8 a.m. at the Life Church Vineyard in Pleasantville. And the Fairfield County 4-H Achievement Award Program is Thursday at 7 p.m. at the Fairgrounds. The Commissioner's Office received the following correspondence. Fairfield County NMH State Fiscal Year Annual Report. A memo from Dr. Perry Brown regarding the update destination downtown Lancaster, entering the workforce, and a homestead program update. The auditor's wins of the week were provided. Correspondence regarding industrial solar projects. A press release from the Fairfield 33 Alliance on April 4th titled Fairfield County Workforce Center to host summer explore career camps and the Fairfield County Health Department's quarterly That is it. Yep. So um, most of you who were here last week heard me ask our staff to put together a map on exclusionary zones for solar. They're still working on that. Um, so hopefully I have that in the near future uh, and then we'll have more to talk about. That's all I have. Yeah. Under uh, old business, um, the indigent defense task force has completed its work, and there has been a report issue. Um, I'll paraphrase that report as just being a bit of an alphabet soup. Um, it just kind of reported out what the task force heard, this, that, and the other thing, um, without what I would refer to as clear direction. Uh, to the legislature as to what that solution should be. Um, I'm advised, though, that in subsequent conversations, um, it, it it seems that Senator Manning particularly is interested in my continued input as the legislation is actually drafted uh, towards a longer term solution on that. So, um, in a sense, if you if you'll recall going into the task force, we felt like we were outnumbered. And the possibility of a conclusion from that task force that was adverse to us seemed very real and that didn't happen so in some ways you could consider that a, a minor success um, i attended the um, Lancaster city council last night um, we the commissioner's office were interested in a couple of issues um, one uh, at a moment uh, last week and perhaps the week before, it looked like the process for transfer of transit from the city to the county was coming off the rails. Um, I'm feeling better after last night's meeting that that, that may be uh, getting back on track. Um, and in that regard, there was a resolution introduced at Lancaster City Council last night to authorize the mayor to enter into negotiations with the county on an MOU probably be on a five-year basis uh, with us agreeing to continue providing transit services in the city and them agreeing to their commitment of $150,000 a year, um, as we had discussed all throughout these discussions. So um, I guess one of the things that, that I, I don't know that any one of us needs permission to have discussions out in the community or with other entities, but if 
I guess I would just like for my colleagues to trust me a little bit in terms of negotiating the final terms and conditions of that MOU with the city. Um, nothing can be entered into by one commissioner, so you don't, you don't need to worry about that. Um, but I, I hope I can bring back a product uh, from those discussions that you can support and that would be consistent with our prior discussions on that issue. You have my support. On both the uh, indigent defense and um, dealing with Lancaster, uh, you are a skilled negotiator. <laughs> and finally, if I might, thank you both for that. Um, there was another minor issue at City Council last night that we were interested in, and that had to do with the uh, change of zoning for a building on Cedar Hill uh, that would potentially be available for a tenant uh, that might leave Colonnade if our contingent contract to acquire that building um, is eventually closed. Uh, it, it seemed to me to be helpful to us uh, for there to be an appropriate landing space for at least one, if not more, of the vacating tenants. So I thought that went well. It was eight to one, um, which with city council, that's about as good as you could get. So um, under new business, Commissioner Davis, anything else? Nothing. Commissioner Fix. Not today, thank you. You do have one item of new business. Uh, Bennett, where are you, Bennett? Back here. One up here. <laughs> So uh, Bennett is uh, soon to get married. Is that correct, Bennett? That's right. <laughs> so what's really interesting, uh, who's going to officiate your wedding? So me and my fiance, Kylie, we wanted to do the courthouse wedding. And instead of having uh, some judge who we didn't know very well do it, I asked Commissioner Davis if he would get ordained and marry us because not only do I consider him a mentor, but a very dear friend, and he graciously so. Mr. Davis will be married me and Tyler on Friday. I have been through the process. I am officially ordained. No, no, no. <laughs> no I asked me to wear a suit. Can you believe it? <laughs> so anyway, Ben and Ted, congratulations from the vendors and staff. We wish uh, you and your fiance at this point in time a very long and happy life. <laughs> so, uh, we're down here at the end. Anything you'd like to talk about today? Anything? Anything? I just want to mention that this round of CDBG applications are due to uh, the Arkansas office this Friday at 4 p.m. from our local communities or nonprofit organizations. After that, we'll review them and then be coming to the commissioners about what we want to utilize, which products, which projects we want to move forward with to utilize our funds um, that we get every two years. And then the other thing I want to mention is that. We are kicking off the model of the zoning code project. We have all um, villages on board now, thanks to Jason Henderson, um, and about half the townships on board. Um, so the um, kickoff email went out about a week ago, and now we're going to start scheduling our first meeting. And that's, that's, uh, I think that's going to be quite an opportunity for the villages and townships because, you know, obviously some can't afford it. To look at zoning and, and bring zoning up to uh, the current levels where it needs to be. So, thank you for doing that. And I look forward to a good outcome. And thank you to all three of you for agreeing to fund that project. So, we really appreciate it. Lisa. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to attend the FFA presentations for the state and national contest and the Amanda Clear Creek schools do a great job. Tony Bowman was there as were state, local and federal uh, agricultural agencies. They did a terrific job and I plan to send a note to their advisor today 
one thing that I thought was tremendously encouraging was how they approach all of the topics about urbanization very similarly. These projects that they were addressing were similar to relevant things that are in our world today with the land use plan. And I thought these very young folks really did good research and also showed good example of how everything is not good and everything is not bad. And they were opening their eyes to all the perspectives and really good examples for adults about how to have civil conversation. So I commended you know, these young folks for the work that they did. Plan to send a note about that today. If you have an opportunity to hear them, I would really encourage that. They are going around to a number of different places at the state house, and various other locations. They get points if they give their presentations to others. Also have the opportunity to attend the annual Heritage District meeting. And um, a lot of the GIS maps were on display. So it's very good um, to see those in, in the use and how they were able to have historic maps as well as some recent ones. Thanks to Josh Harper for completing several EPA forms. It's overnight research to get that to the EPA. Also want to say thanks to Lori Kidder and Julie White because they recently are renewing their notaries. And I want to mention that because we have six notaries and without charge, those um, employees will provide those services to members of the public. Homestead, we have more than 8,000 participants and that is where all of our calls are coming in right now. And most of the calls relate to how they believe the cap on the age 70 has already passed the legislature. It hasn't even left conference yet. And there is some confusion about that. So I just mentioned that there hasn't been any change in the legislation yet. Um, BOR, as an update, we have 43 total cases of which all have either been scheduled, addressed, or are pending. That's very good in terms of a number that's quite manageable. We will be likely done by the end of the May as long as there aren't any requests for continuances. Then the online National AGA conference, of which the topics related to uniform guidance, all of us with um, JFS backgrounds or EMA or even DD, <coughs> did not find the notice about uniform guidance to be terribly um, new. Um, but for those who aren't used to those types of guidance, it was new. And a great deal of that is, comes down to whichever is more restrictive, the local, state, or federal, you go with whatever is more restrictive in terms of the guidance. And that's the easiest way to explain that very long part of the conference. There are some new GASB pronouncements of which Stacy is aware of. We have um, several different analysis relating to the airport and Nothing that I heard at the conference changed any of those answers. And relating to the Veteran Services Seminar, that's scheduled now for September 26th in Pickerington at the Wigwam. Or is it the Fairfield Center? I think it's at the Fairfield Center. It's September 26th at the Fairfield Center. Um, that was listed as a good practice from the um, Veterans Association. The more outreach you can do to help veterans, the better from their perspective. That was listed as something um, good at the local level. And so we'll send some reminders out about that as the time approaches. You mentioned uh, young people in FFA. And of course, I, uh, Thursday night, I have the opportunity to go to the 4-H Achievement uh, event. And I'm, every time I go to that, I'm always so encouraged by some of these young people. And, but they've been able to accomplish. So it's it amazing really good, leadership good, skills. Good confidence in the future. Tony, anything you'd like to <clears throat> Rick. So we get the press release out for our summer camp, uh, summer camps this summer. We've got one for uh, Builders Camp, the uh, Monics Camp, uh, Healthcare Heroes Camp, and Girls STEM Camp. And uh, it's the end of this year. Um, Lancaster City Schools once again are providing unbelievable amount of support of uh, our teachers support needs to be our last experience. Thank you so much to them, Pickerington Schools providing an instructor and also uh, Community Action is providing some support too. So we're able to add two more classes this year. So uh, girls STEM camp last year was uh, on channel four, I believe. Yeah. That's uh, so last year. Talked about an individual rather than Fairfield County putting all that together. So 
made a good impact. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, it's free to uh, any Fairfield County uh, student going into sixth, seventh, or eighth. I, I, I think this is terrific. What, what's your expectation on turnout? Uh, we're uh, looking at about 250. That's good. That's perfect. Oh. Uh, just everything went well yesterday with our uh, planned event. Um, good to have those. It refreshes us on on the planned event. So everything went well, and our staff did a great job coordinating. Thanks, Ben. And anything? Nothing from the next. Or anything? Uh, a, a reminder, April is Child Abuse Prevention Month, and tomorrow we invite everybody to wear blue uh, to raise awareness for that effort and also to attend uh, the breakfast, our annual breakfast tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock at Life Church Vineyard. Breakfast and networking at 8 o'clock, and the event starts uh, with the presentation at 8 30. Emphasis on prevention. Yes. Yeah, I picked up on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There are no announcements. Approval minutes for April 2nd, 2024. So moved. Second. Discussion? Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Minutes passed 3 0 from the Commissioner's Resolution 2024 4.9.A, a resolution to approve the appointment of Felicia Hentz to the Violet Township New Community Authority. And the Commissioner, I move items A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Discussion. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Le Levesey? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. From Fairfield County Economic and Workforce Development, Resolution 2024 4.9.H, a resolution to approve loan documents to Fund Beer Geeks LLC as a Fairfield County CARES Act EDA revolving loan fund project. Under Fairfield County Economic and Workforce Development, I move items H and I. Second. Discussion? Oh, Over right. that project <laughs> at the Workforce Center. So you expecting that to be completed by update? Look for September ish. <laughs> before. I, I, I see no guarantee that we'll be in a long jump. You need to guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of extenuating circumstances. Any uh, additional discussion? Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yeah. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. From Fairfield County Emergency Management Agency, Resolution 2024 4.9.J. A resolution to appropriate from unappropriated in a major expenditure object category, EMA funds number 2090. So moved. Second. Discussion. Well, Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. From Fairfield County Engineer, Resolution 2024 4.9.K. A resolution to approve the contract bid award for the WAL 05 Geiger Road Superstructure Replacement Project. So moved. Second. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. From Fairfield County Job and Family Services, Resolution 2024 4.9, yeah. a resolution to approve a memo received an expenditure for Fairfield County Job and Family Services, Fund 2599, reimbursing Fund 2018. The Fairfield County Job and Family Services, I move items L and M. Second. Discussion? Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yeah. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. From Fairfield County Regional Planning Commission, 
Resolution 2024-4.9.N, a resolution to approve an award of bid to Cooper Concrete Services, LLC, for the CDBG PY-2 Village of Pleasantville Pool Improvements Concrete Deck. So moved. Second. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levison? Yes. Motion passes 3-0. Payment of bills, resolution 2024-4.9.0, a resolution authorizing the approval of payment of invoices for departments that need Board of Commissioners approval. So moved. Being done, roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levisey? Yes. Motion passes 3-0. The next regular meeting is scheduled for April 16th at 9 a.m. <laughs> Any uh, additional items that come before the Board of Commissioners at this time? Sir, please. I was just going to ask Brandon and John if you would have a minute to visit with me after the meeting hour. And Mr. President. Anyone else looking for a motion?